and welcome to another call. So today we have an exciting conversation that's ahead of us, and we're going to be talking about the energy of sacred places all around the world. And for this, I've invited a dear friend of mine and a guest for today, Amy Patty Colvin. So first, let me tell you a little bit about her so that you know where this conversation is heading. So since the 1990s, Amy discovered compassion, meditation, and Qigong, and has since learned many tools and techniques on how to integrate the stillness with the natural movement of internal energy, which is what's also known as Qi. And she does this as, a, as an effective method for transforming physical, mental, and emotional challenges. Now, as a certified teacher of Stanford University's, <clears throat> I'm sorry, compassion cultivation training, she combines this program's elements along with her years of the personal practice to help others heal from a very loving and compassionate approach, which I think is something that we could all benefit from in our life, right? Now, today, Amy leads international spiritual tours, which not only provide amazing travel opportunities to explore the fascinating parts of our beautiful world, but on these tours, participants also connect with the wisdom and energy of ancient sacred sites and the raw landscapes. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. Amy, thank you so much for joining us. You are very welcome. Thanks for hosting me today. I'm excited about having this conversation with you. As am I. So people that know me personally in my life, I love to travel. I mean, I don't know who doesn't, but I love to travel. So when we connected, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I love this. So before we even get into that, can you share with us just a little bit of how you began your spiritual journey? Because everybody's story is different. Absolutely. So, um, and it ties a little bit with travel because at the time when I tapped into the spiritual journey, I was working and living in Denali National Park in Alaska. So out there in the middle of nowhere and my sister, and this was, gosh, 30 years ago. So before cell phones, before anything else. So somehow she managed to get a hold of me and said, I'm going to this workshop in Portland. You need to get down here. And so you know, I pulled it off and I was introduced to a man named Leong Tan, who is um, from, grew up in Malaysia and he teaches a blend of, of Taoism, Confucianism and Buddhism. Um, so it's in, he's coined it spiritual energies of the heart, some thought. And so I took to it like a fish to water. And a couple of the things that really worked well for me is that ever since I was little, I mean, I'm a very kinesthetic person, as you as you'll see through this interview, I'm waving my hands around all the time. But ever since I was little, I just would spontaneously move into certain ways. And I just thought I was totally strange. And then I meet this teacher and he teaches us how to connect with our internal energy so that we can maximize that connection to our energy and our higher selves and let that come out into movement. So suddenly it was like, wow, this is exactly what I've been doing my whole life. I feel like I'm home. So um, I have been studying with him, like I said, for about 30 years, and I have been teaching that style of meditation and rolling it together with the compassion cultivation training curriculum out of Stanford um, since about 2011. So that's, that's how I got into it was, you know, God bless my sister for saying there's a teacher I think you ought to meet. Mm -hmm. And I usually try to see him either for a weekend workshop or weekly week long workshop once or twice a year. And is he still, is still in Portland? No, actually, he lives, he, he has lived traditionally in Thailand. And so he, he flies over to the States and does workshops in various places. He now lives in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, but uh, does workshops throughout the U.S., mostly in the southeast of all places, and then um, has week-long workshops uh, in Georgia. And we're trying out a new venue in California. So, nice. yeah. And I love how things happen. I mean, people call it synchronicity, people call it, you know, different things, but it's that thing, like you just said, your sister called you, said, I think you should go. And it's something that transformed your life. It's something yes. that gave you an answer to something you weren't even looking for. You thought you were just being weird. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> and, and yet there's like a logical, in a way, a logical sense to the why you were doing it. So I think that's fascinating. 
And I love that you said maximizing our connection to ourselves and to our environment, because that's kind of what we're talking about. So now let's get into like the nitty gritty of what we're talking about. So what are the countries? Let's start with there. What are the countries that you have done spiritual tours for already? So I have gone, I've gone to Peru. That was my first one. And I'm going back there in April, looking for a few people to join me with, on that journey, which will be fantastic. Um, I started in Peru. I've run trips in Ireland. I've run trips in Scotland. I'm doing a trip next fall to Scotland that sold out in the first three weeks I announced it, which is pretty neat. Nice. Um, I had planned on going to Eastern Turkey in 2024, but because of the earthquakes mm -hmm. and other things, we'll probably push that out to 2025. I've been there to Eastern Turkey in particular, and can't wait to go back. Um, and I'm looking at doing a trip to Patagonia in 2025. I've taken mm -hmm. trips to Tanzania. I took a group on safari there and we spent a day um, with a couple of nomadic tribes, which was really neat. Nice. So those are places that I've been places that, you know, I, I'm excited about exploring just about any place that's possible to go. Um, mm. I, you know, I would like to take a trip. I've been to Siem Reap in Cambodia and I would love to take some people back to Siem Reap. Um, so there's, there's just, it, for me, what I love about these trips is that, is that I specifically try to find whatever places are spiritual to the people that were there or to their ancestors. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's not just your everyday bucket tour, but being mm -hmm. able to go to these places. And so it's like, well, you know, what's, what's spiritual about Patagonia I just want to find the original people that were there and like, what can we do to tap into that? And so there's that whole element. But then on top of that, no matter where you go, you can tap into that energy of the landscape around. Mm -hmm. So I'm not much of a city person. I love being out mm -hmm. in, you know, big, expansive um, landscapes and and uh, in a little while and later in our conversation, I'll, I'll suggest an exercise that that all of us can practice where it doesn't matter where you are, but it's a way to tap into your own internal energy and harmonize that with the energy outside of you. And it's funny because you just mentioned two different things, which is where I was leading to. So my first question was, why did you take the people there? Why did you go? And it's kind of what you also answered. It's a lot of the spiritual beliefs and the tribes and the people and their stories and their beliefs. And it's connecting. So I don't know the correct word for it, but I know when a lot of people have a collective thought or a belief or a something, it's like a consciousness that grows. And when we visit these places, because I've visited some of the places that you've talked about and others, there is something, poetically speaking, we could say, there's something in the air. There is an mm -hmm. energy mm -hmm. that you have to be there to experience. And then with what you just said right now, even if it's the landscape, it's mother nature. And I think sometimes we forget how energetic and beautiful and high vibrational it is to just go and admire her for the actual beauty that it is right right and what's really fascinating so uh, you know I would love to share stories about some of the things that I've done but this story ties with what you're saying so uh last last year we went to Scotland and we focused on um going to the highlands and the outer Hebrides and Orkney Island and if any of the, if any of, of you listening are familiar with Outlander, um, you'll know that in the beginning, there's a scene where Claire falls through this stone circle. And so we went to the Kalanish stones, which is what that stone circle was, was uh, modeled after. And these stone circles are very old. They're older than the pyramids. They're older than so many other places. And they're, they're, astonishing for their engineering and beautiful for their simplicity. Mm -hmm. And there's one stone in the middle that, um, you know, I just, I, I stood in front of it and just, you know, that uplifting power. So 
a lot of the folks that were traveling with me, this, this concept of connecting to their internal energy and connecting to the chi and then moving with it is pretty foreign. But mm -hmm. I, you know, I gave them an example. And one of the, one of the people that were, was on that trip with me is, has also studied for a long time with the same teacher as me. And so I said, you know, would you like to come try this? And, and so she found herself moving and, what I was saying to the group is, you know, this is totally spontaneous and totally about trust, trust in self. If movement bubbles up, excellent. If it doesn't bubble up, that's fine too, but allow whatever it is to come up. So the, it's not a mental construct. And, you know, at the time people were, people didn't want to be on stage, right? So they, I said, does anybody else want to try this? And what was cool about that stone and, and you know, it's true in so many places is on one side of the stone, the energy was rising and on the other side of the stone, it was drawing down. And so my body um, illustrated that. And without me saying anything about it, you know, I, I went to one side of the stone, I went to the other, had my experience, I invited this other woman, you know, front side, back side, she had an experience, and it was similar to mine. And then I said, and that's because the energy was rising on the one side, falling on the other side, does anybody else want to try them? And they're all like, no. But as soon as we just disbanded, and we're having free time in that space, people went up to the stone. And afterwards, when we talked about it, and I wasn't observing. I just, I let people do what they wanted to do, mm -hmm. right? But afterwards we talked about it and almost everyone felt something and they could feel the mm -hmm. difference between the front side and the back side of that mm -hmm. stone. And so what you were saying about this, this collective vibration, that that is such a big piece of it. So for ages, literally thousands of years, people are in this space and their energy is harmonizing with the energy of these stones and it's there and i just i think especially in in western society maybe particularly the united states society we're not taught to feel you know we're so locked into our brains what do you think about this we're not taught what do you feel what do you notice in your body you know, I mean, even if we're, if people say, oh, how, what do you feel? They think of it in terms of emotion mm -hmm. and a big piece of what I teach and how I work with people is let's bring that into the body because, oh, I'm going off on a tangent here, but <laughs> one of the, one of the things that is truly profound about the meditation style that I practice and what I've been taught and have noticed in my own body is the idea that this spontaneous movement, this connection with our higher selves and that willingness to let trust and self bubble up and trusting that movement, it is profoundly healing. I have seen such amazing things happen for people in meditation workshops where they allow themselves to move mm -hmm. and stuff that had been stuck intellectually emotionally for years and years and years bubbles up becomes free and is dissipated right and to me that that is just so profound so you know i that's that's what i'm excited about sharing with people is how to access that for themselves and how to grow and release old trauma through this process of connecting with self, trusting in self, and then moving it out. And a few things. So I completely agree. We are not taught. I actually personally believe we are purposely not taught to mm -hmm. connect with energy and our feelings. And that's a whole other conversation. But even with emotions, it just not even talking vibration, just talking emotions, the whole aspect of what do you feel it's and I always say it I consider us talking heads so many are disembodied from our bodies that we live in our heads and what you're talking about right now to release all those energetics from the mind from the body I'm sorry when I studied alternative medicine and I did the bioenergetics that's exactly what it was so bioenergetics literally teaches you the body is the unconscious mind which we're also never taught so if our body has a memory of a trauma, of a perception, of whatever it is, 
and it starts somewhere. We don't even have to know the story of it. We don't even have to know what it is. Right. And it's what you just said. As long as you, if you feel like moving in a weird way, because you, you don't know what, follow it. The body needs for us to allow it to do what it needs to do to recalibrate itself. And there's so many people that don't know this because we have been taught that this is what you have, this is why it is, and this is how you fix it. And it's all very logical, medical, and manufactured. But our own energy, our own body, especially like on trips like this, connecting, which is kind of where I want to jump off to, many of these sacred sites, many of the, much of the land has its own energy. But many of these sacred sites do have that collective vibration, but they were also built there. Who knows how long ago? Who knows by who? But they mostly are in energetic portal ports, portals of the world. By us connecting to the energy and then allowing our energy, we are magnifying the healing, the capability, the energy, the vibration of, by just being there. We can do it anywhere, but it's it's kind of like a double battery that you give it, right? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and the nice thing is uh, there are places that we all, you know, that, you know, we know in lore that are these energetic portals or vortices, you know, like Sedona, Arizona, or the stone circles in Scotland, or Machu Picchu, um, or some of these places I like to go in, in Eastern Turkey, um, they're all there. And, you know, we can... and. I like what you said earlier, it's like, you know, I, we can read about it, but until we're there, mm -hmm. we don't know what that feels like. And it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. But I also want to highlight that, that it can be anywhere. I mean, I remember uh, I was on a road trip in my twenties and a girlfriend and I were driving around the perimeter of the United States in her gold Volkswagen bug. And we'd stopped in this, in the Smoky Mountains and we were doing, we're hiking just a trail in Smoky Mountains. And this was long before I ever met my teacher. Well, not long before, but it was before I met my teacher. And I remember walking along in that forest. And the next thing you know, my arms were just floating up. And, you know, and I was in awe, really, because I, I didn't in, I didn't specifically invite it. Mm -hmm. I, but it was happening. And, you know, so to me, that's an example of I, I possibly that's a spiritual vortex and I just didn't know it, don't know it. But to me, especially at that time, it was just a place where I was moved to move. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we have that capacity to do that. And like you said, it's, it, if you are in those sacred spaces, it is like this double battery charge and it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, but and, and and it's exciting for someone like me and for someone like you, because we know how to work with that internal energy. But even for people who are just randomly hiking in these places, mm -hmm. they might not be able to articulate it, but they can feel something mm -hmm. too. Right. And what the other thing that I think is really fun to think about is that each of us harmonize with energy in our own different ways. So um, the first time I'd ever gone to Machu Picchu, my, my teacher, Leon, and it, at that time, he had a, a an apprentice named Meg. They were both there, and we were at, at where we were staying in this very nice uh, landscaped complex. We were outside doing some energy oriented work and and discovery and training and so on and so forth. And so, uh, Meg invited somebody to go sit on a particular boulder, and that person sat on that boulder, and she just you know had such this amazing experience of bliss. And so uh, I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And Meg said, well, do you want to try it? And I said, sure. So I went over and I sat on that same boulder. The next thing you know, I was immediately catapulted off it backwards. And I did a somersault into the flowers behind me. So it was, it was not the right place for me. It was the right uh -huh. place for her, uh -huh. but it was not the right place for me. Uh -huh. um, so can I just dive into this fun little exercise? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> so what I, I would invite it. all of you to try after this after this conversation is over, and, and it's an illustration of, of connecting with your own internal energy and the fact that you can connect anywhere you are. 
um, find some place in your in your home or outside in a park or someplace that you know. Go to whatever calls you. And then when you get to that space, turn your body literally 360 degrees around with a soft gaze and just pay attention and notice if any place in that 360 degrees calls to you. And then go back to wherever it is that's called to you. So it could be where you started out. It could be 90 degrees away. It doesn't matter. That's a way of listening to your intuition and harmonizing with your energy. So once you've found the place and the direction you want to face, then bow forward as a gesture of respect for yourself, your higher self and the world around you. Turn 90 degrees, bow again, turn 90 degrees, bow again, turn 90 degrees, bow again. So it, you don't have to bow in four directions. You're not bowing to the four corners of the room, just starting from where you are. And then internally, say for yourself, guided movements, please come and see what bubbles up. See if anything arises for you. And if, if it's as simple as a little bit of a sway, great. If it's a little bit of a spiral, great. If it's something big, great. If it's stillness, great. There is no judgment around it. It's just an exercise. But then as you, you know, and then when you're ready, sometimes the movement will stop of its own volition and that experience is over. Or if you feel like it's too big or too overwhelming, you can stop at any time on your own just by, you know, saying internally stop. Mm -hmm. um, but try it out. See what happens. There's something so powerful about going to a space where you're feeling called, turning 360 degrees to see which direction you're really supposed to face, bowing in four directions, and then inviting internal movement to come. And it's, it's a really great exercise that anybody can practice anywhere. Yeah. And it's simple. It's not so esoteric. People are like what you said, I'm bowing to the four corner. No, I mean, it's just a matter of acknowledging maybe for the first time and, and even us that we connect and we do this and we feel things. It's a matter of connecting daily to our own surroundings the home we live in, the space we're always in. It's a matter of acknowledging and saying, what do I feel? And maybe start training ourselves in how does this feel? How do I feel different? What if my body just moves? I've never, I love to dance, like Latin dance. I absolutely love to dance. And it's that feeling of movement. But I've heard from professional dancers and people who dance in high school or whatever, that they would always feel something so liberating in their dances. And it was because of that. It was just going with the flow and with the harmonizing. We don't see it that way because we've been taught that it's a dance, but it's that it's allowing the movement of the body and then connecting it with the energy that's around you and your own energy. How many things can we actually feel? How much of it is actually there waiting for us? Right, right. And that truly is that essence of Taoism, that sense of harmonizing mm -hmm. and blending our internal energy, our chi, with the energy of the world around us. I mean, everything is energetic. We, you, you are shaped like you and I am shaped like me just because that's the way our energetic molecules are hanging together. Mm -hmm. The plant behind you, the desk behind you, the monitors in front of us, it's all just part of energy. And it's its shape is nothing more than the way it was designed to be. Mm -hmm. So talking back about like the sacred sites, I just gave them an, uh, a name. Since I was very young, I was, I always am very connected to Egypt and the Egyptian culture. And I began with the myths and blah, blah, blah. Fast forward to today, I have learned so much about maybe why they were there and the actual energy portal that it is and scientifically and logical i've heard of explanations of how it's a conductor of energy so all of these different places also have their own energy of from the beginning why they were built why they were built there and then like we said all the collective energy and yet although they're very much some of them are very similar to other mega structures around the world. 
yet they each do something different from my point of view, which is what I'm going to ask you. Now, I wrote down the places. So you've been to Peru, to Ireland, to Scotland, to Eastern Turkey, all of these places. Have you felt their own energetic prints in a way that, let's call it personality, that you can say, oh, Peru was like this. Egypt was in your experience. That's a great question. Um, and one I've never thought about. So Yes, in the sense of, um, okay, let me rephrase. So I don't know if I closed my eyes and let's say there was this buffet line of energetic ex <laughs> experiences in front of me mm -hmm. and I put my hand over this energetic experience and that energetic experience and that one, mm -hmm. I don't know that I'd be able to go, oh, this one's Peru, that one's Scotland, this one's Egypt, this one's Petra and Jordan. Um but what I can tell you is whether or not I could identify the actual location. If, you know, if we had these little energy blobs on a buffet line, if I put my hand over one, I would have a particular experience. If I put my hand over another one, I would have a different experience. If I put my hand over another one, I would have a different experience. So they each have their own energy signature. Mm -hmm. But could I say... You know, being in being in this beautiful temple of the moon cave at Machu Picchu, well, is different than standing in front of the Kalander Stone. Could I say that they were different? I was about ready to say no, but of course they are because for me, caves and wide open spaces have totally different feels. <laughs> right, right. You know, but okay, so let's let's rephrase it. Let's say I've gone down the hallway and I'm right in the middle of the Pyramid of Giza. Mm -hmm. which I've been to. And then here I am in this temple of the moon cave. Would I feel something differently? And again, I guess I would have to say yes, in part because this cave is a natural structure. It is of the earth mm -hmm. and a temple was built within that, mm -hmm. but you're still, it's got that raw energy of the earth along with some great engineering. And the heart of the pyramid of Giza is a completely human manufactured thing. It's got, you know, it just, so yes, those two would have a completely different energy signature. Um, trying to think. Yeah, I guess for me, what I would say is that maybe it's not so much about where in the world they are, but the the amount of manufacturing or essence that goes into it. So I was just thinking about, you know, being on Bell Rock in Sedona, Arizona, mm -hmm. um, or Cathedral Rock, either one of those. And then, you know, which is a, a purely natural landscape. And then being at the Kalander Stones, which is outside. And the Kalander Stones is not, I mean, there's engineering behind it because of what it is. Just like there's engineering behind you know, Pyramid of Giza, but they're both outside and yeah, they would have different energy signatures. So it's just, it's, yeah, that's a great question. It's fun to think about. So again, could I say, oh, this one feels like, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, I was just, I was thinking about also there's a, there's a wonderful place in um, Eastern Turkey called Ani, A-N-I, and its nickname is the city of 10,000 churches. And once upon a time, it was on the Silk Road and was a huge trading center. And there literally were 10,000 churches in this place, all of Armenian design. And I love Armenian church architect mm -hmm. architecture. It's so beautiful. But there was this huge earthquake. Everything fell down. And right at that time, um, travel via water was becoming more prevalent. And so the trade mm -hmm. center went to Constantinople, which is now mm -hmm. Istanbul. And But being there in the in, in Ani, and, you know, I was with a group of, of travelers. I was the youngest one in that group and certainly the only one energetically, spiritually oriented. But, oh, my gosh, the resonance of that place. And, you know, and part of that was because it, there was all this engineering that went into these churches. And yet 
there were all these churches because there was this innate spiritual connectivity and there was you know the place was on a mesa and you look down into these river canyons on two different sides and you know it's just it's just incredible it is. you know so it is fascinating to think about why these various cultures built these things in various places and i you know you can go out and read about the ley lines and i i don't know mm-hmm. intellectually that much about them but there's all these spiritual sites on these ley lines and it's like now how did that happen right it's- definitely a topic it is and the reason I threw that question at you is because okay I have gone to different places on this side of the continent so I can definitely feel the difference for me when I go to Sedona to when I go to Mount Shasta to when I went to Peru completely different and yet every time I go in a repeat to the same place, it's a different experience. Mm -hmm. And the reason I want to say that is because we are different every single day. Yes. Our emotions, our thoughts, our actions change our vibration in a matter of seconds. So if I went three years ago, all the things that happened in three years and the state of mind, emotional, physical, mental, the whole thing of when I go again, each one of us is going to receive what we need to receive or how we're going to perceive it at that now moment, no matter where we are. Right. And the reason I want to say this is because even though you've gone to those places and you would like to take different people to those places, even the same people can visit the same location and have a totally different experience because that's part of the beautiful magic that I consider us as energetic beings if we're able to connect and I don't want to say take advantage, but yes, take advantage of the power that we are and of the beautiful energy that all of these places offer, regardless why or how or when they were built. Absolutely. All the more reason you should go back to Machu Picchu with me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that will be fun. But to, to your point, so going back to that exercise I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. so if you wanted to, and you like to take notes or you like to journal or whatever, practice with that exercise, make notes of what that experience is, go back to that same space a week later. Mm -hmm. Are you called to the same direction? Mm -hmm. Is your experience similar or different? And just begin making notes. That's a wonderful way to start really building that sense of connection um, with yourself. And you're absolutely right. We energetically were different beings every single day. And, you know, and the people around us are affecting our emotions and our energy. And so is it, is, are you having an experience that's different than the last time because of the people you're with? It's not because of the people you're with. It's because of how you are in the presence of those people in that space and the weather. Right. You know. And it's a collaboration also. So now I'm going to share a story. It's a collaboration also of the people and everything we're doing. On, on one of the stops we did on that trip to Peru, we visited a, this is this is like outside the ball nuts. We visited a shaman. We went into the place where he had us. We were a group of 20, I think, people. We went into the group. We sat in a circle. He began drumming. And he began um, incense. I'm trying to think of the word in English. So he began spreading the incense. And I could hear him walking around. And then all of a sudden, I'd get that that smoke of the incense closer to me and farther from me. And I don't know what that incense had. I don't know if it had it was smoked ayahuasca or I was just in a trance. Or I have no idea. But I had the most funny orgasmic experience ever that I was even embarrassed to tell people afterwards. So we were a group of 20 and half of me was hallucinating, seeing, visioning, dreaming. I don't know what you want to call it. Me with one of the guys that he was also single and we had connected like really well on the trip. Like all these Kamaj Sutra positions like it was just and I was like oh my god no what am I doing and then I would focus back on something else 
And the something else was actually a group. And I saw our entire group up on a cliff. We were all dressed in white. So exactly what we were doing, but up on a cliff. We were all dressed in white. And then the bodies turned from clothing to light. Like I could see the Mm -hmm. spiritual being of each person. And that my mind would bring me back to him and like all these different things. And I was like, how is that like, oh my God, no, 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 no. Like, no, I have to know, no. And I'd go back and it lasted the entire time. When we were all said and done and we saw a whole bunch of things. When we were sharing our experience, the only one I shared my experience, that side of it with, was with my sister on the airplane a few days after. Like I couldn't even come out to say it because I was like, just looking at him would embarrass me like of everything I just saw. But when I when we all shared the other experience, we all had the same experience. We all saw each other on that cliff, dressed in white, and then as spiritual beings. And we all saw the eagle that flew or, I mean, it was amazing. And so besides sharing the story, part of what I wanted to share with that is so many things affect us. We don't even know why we had that shared experience, but we did. And there's so many things that are unexplainable, yet so real that we have to trust ourselves, which is part of what you're talking about. We have to learn how to trust ourselves and say, okay, that is an experience we all had. It's not me going crazy and making this up. Right. Ah, It sounds like a wonderful, wonderful trip and a wonderful experience. And yeah, whether it's, whether it's um, an envisioning something like that or whether it's moving in an unexpected way, I think that is the key is recognizing that you're not making it up mm-hmm. and that you, you know, trust yourself enough to know this is what I'm meant to experience right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and trust it is, yourself- it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And if, you know, and trust yourself to know that sometimes if you don't feel anything, that there's not something broken in you, that there's not something wrong. It's just in this moment, it's not, you know, that movement, that I, that vision is not coming, but it, it will come back. Mm-hmm. I love it. We're running out of time. I would love to talk about this more. And like, I have so many different things about different sites, but where can people connect with you? Where could they find more of your tours? What's the best place for them to go? You know, the, the easiest way to get access to whatever it is I'm doing is um, if you go to www.amypattcolvin.com and the, uh, I don't know if it'll show up in the Zoom, mm-hmm. but the but it's written out on my name, mm-hmm. uh, amypattcolvin.com. And you'll find the tours that I'm leading there. You'll find information about a new um personal development project that I'm I'm putting together there. I do teach uh, Qigong for free on Mondays at 7 to 7.45 Pacific time. If you are interested in just getting together for 45 minutes and practicing moving your body, um, you can find a place to sign up for that on my website as well. But you also will find me on YouTube um, and you can find me on Insight Timer as well so those are some of the places where you can reach me but the the best the best places go to my website if you're if you'd like to be up to date with where i'm going next what i'm doing there's a a, an opportunity to sign up for a newsletter list nice beautiful Um, amy thank you so much for joining me i i love to travel i love energy i love spirituality i mean there's no buts about it (laughs) so thank you for taking the time You're welcome. And thanks for inviting me onto your show. It was wonderful to be able to talk with you today. All right. Bye everyone. Take care.